Uh, welcome, Howard Greenberg. This is Howard Greenberg. Am I supposed to talk into this? Yeah, we can. <laughs> <Is it? Okay. laughs> Thank you, Sasha. Well, we, we will continue in English, of course, because how's your Dutch? Uh, bad. bad. Okay. Well, not, not, not to exist. Okay, then Sorry. We'll just uh, continue in English. Sorry. I'm very um, lucky because everybody here speaks English. I'm very yeah. lucky. Thank you. <laughs> if somebody doesn't speak English, raise your hand. If you don't understand See the question, that? It's raise incredible. <laughs> okay, welcome, Howard. Uh, the next hour we will be talking about uh, and looking at your uh, collection of uh, photographs um, and why you collected these photographs. Uh, and you uh, are, of course, uh, you, you could ask questions um, in the end uh, and ask Howard everything you always wanted to know about him. Uh, <laughs> always. <laughs> always, yes. Okay. Well, you have been uh, collecting photos for about 40 years, I believe. <laughs> um, no, that's not a question yet. <laughs> it's, it's a statement. Okay. <laughs> I, th I, I was going to, you know, try and determine whether it was 41 or 39, but, you know. Okay. We'll well, let's keep yeah. it at about 40 years, uh, and you have been finding them everywhere from flea markets to attics. What is the strangest place you've ever found a good photograph? This is not rehearsed, you see. <laughs> this, is, this is the strangest question I've ever been asked. <laughs> it's, it's one point for me, because Stra you said all the questions have okay, been always okay, asked. So. Okay, okay, okay. Um, I really did my best for this one. The, uh, forgive me, but most of my answers are far too long. <laughs> so I, I told the story just the other day. Um, I used to, when I was a young photographer, I used to photograph paintings for a woman named Doris Lee, um, who was an artist in Woodstock, New York. And, and Doris Lee's first husband was a photographer named Russell Lee. And um, Russell uh, was in the Farm Securities Administration. And Doris really didn't want me to ask her about his photographs or talk about them. She wasn't interested. They split up in 1938. And um, Doris passed away, and, and uh, a local antique dealer called me one day and asked me to come over to her house. They were settling the affairs. And <laughs> when, when I used to uh, go into Doris's home, she was always wearing an old house coat, and she was usually reclining, often uh, a little bit drunk, on a daybed. And it was covered with a, a you know, a, a uh, some material that draped down over on the floor. Well, all these years that I had been asking Doris about Russell Lee's photograph, she had under this daybed two cartons <laughs> of photographs, and I had no idea, and I would talk to her, and they were right there for the year. Well, I bought those two cartons of photographs, and there were about 500 photographs uh, mostly by Russell Lee and several by Dorothy Lange and Walker Evans. Under her and bed. Under her, oh, yeah, gosh. this cow, right, right. Okay, well, okay. Well, that was a pretty strange place for yeah. Well, every journey, as they say, starts with one step. What was your first step in photography? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think my first step was probably looking at my uh, parents' uh, photo albums <laughs> of the family, right? just like everybody else's first step. I mean, we, we look at uh, images from, from the beginning in, in various ways, and, and I have a feeling that was my first step. I didn't know photography was gonna be in my life at that point, but I knew I liked to look at photographs. So you might say that was my first step. Yeah. Well, there, there was another step, and it was, uh, that brought you to Woodstock. Mm -hmm. When I think of Woodstock, I think of the festival and, and the hippie community and Bob Dylan and everything. Mm -hmm. um, Jimi Hendrix, for instance, did it still have that hippie spirit when you arrived there? Anyway? Very much so. And was it good, a good place? Do you to want to see a photograph of me? Yeah, from did there? you have a beard and long hair? I did, <laughs> as long as it would get. I mean, it started falling out a long time ago, so it wasn't so long, <laughs> yes. No, it was that, a, good, a good place to, to start, uh, well, being, uh, you started as a photographer. Yeah. Woodstock was a, not a good place, it was a great place. Woodstock gave me my adult life, truly. And, and that's because, uh, uh, well, first it gave me a job. I, I had just been photographing for not even two years, and I immediately got a, a job as the photographer for the Woodstock Times, and I made $15 a week, and I 
had carte blanche to photograph whatever I want, and, and it, it really enabled me to, to be a photographer and also to meet a lot of incredible people because the other thing about Woodstock, it was an art colony founded in 1902. So uh, it had this amazing history throughout the entire 20th century of uh, great creative people living there, passing through painters, artists, writers, musicians, long before the festival, uh, all kinds of people. And they were still there, or either they were there or the sons and daughters were there. And, and um, I, I became very much in, involved in this uh, wonderful community with this great history. And, and the history of Woodstock is what brought me to the history of photography. Um, because some great photographers were there, like Russell Lee I mentioned, and um, one of the photographers in the photo secession was Alfred Stieglitz had um, lived in Woodstock for many years, starting in 1902 from the first colony, and I discovered her photographs, beautiful old platinum prints, like I had never seen up to then. So uh, it, it all happened, you know, from my being in Woodstock, yeah. But you started there as a photographer for the Woodstock? Uh, times, 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 yes. Very famous newspaper. Yes. <laughs> it's still publishing. <laughs> Incredible, after all these years, it hasn't gone out of business with me. But you stopped being a photographer then. Why? Well, as I say, I got interested in the history. And I also, um, uh, there was an organization called the Woodstock Artist Association. It had been in existence since 1930. And it was where the, the artists had a cooperative and they would have shows and things like that. And um, in, in the bylaws of, of the Woodstock Artists Association, the rules for the organization, it said, and this is true, it said photographers should hang themselves in the basement. <laughs> this is true. That's what they thought of photography. It wasn't a put down. It was just that they had a small room in the basement for photography <laughs> and, and hang your own pictures there. And um, that is, a friend of mine, Dennis Stock, who, who was a magnum photographer and lived in Woodstock, pointed this out to me. And um, it, it sort of, it was the seed uh, to the idea of starting a place for photography in Woodstock, a real place for photography. And, and I went on and founded a place called the Cats, we, at that time it was the Catskill Center for Photography. Uh, it's still in existence, and now it's called the Center for Photography in Woodstock. And it was 1977, and uh, we established it as a not not-for-profit um, school and gallery workshop program and so on. So that, that was my sort of first step out of being a photographer. I suddenly became an arts administrator. And, um, and then uh, eventually about, not long, after about three years, I could barely pay a bill, I, I decided to go into the business and sell photographs and have my own gallery, which I opened right around the corner from the Photography Center, and that's sort of how it happened. Yeah, but yeah. And how it happened, and there was a change, because, uh, well, you were a dealer in buying and selling photographs, but tell us about the first photo you wanted to keep for yourself. Well, uh, okay, I, I told the story, and I'll tell it again about one of the photographs upstairs, but that came later. The, the first photograph that I, I have to say that I, re, I really collected, it didn't mean that I was a collector, it just was a great photograph. Uh, the, do you know the photographer Jerry Yulesman? Jerry Yulesman was, was uh, he's still pretty famous, but in the 70s he was a very big deal and, and he made photographs, he would take two or three, sometimes four negatives and combine them in, into one photograph and, and he was the best at it and he, he uh, was one of my heroes because I had been doing a similar kind of thing on my own without knowing who he was. And then I learned of him uh, and I took a workshop with him in 1972. And one of his photographs was called Apocalypse Now. It's, it's in a lot of the history books. And um, uh, he was a great guy, Jerry. And uh, I, he used to smoke cigars and I mentioned to him that my father um, actually sold cigars. So Jerry and I uh, talked about it and we decided that he was gonna give me a print of Apocalypse 2 for two boxes of scars. <laughs> and and I, I have to say, I think that was the first real photograph, the first serious, you know, like work of art photograph uh, that I ever collected. Yeah. And how often has it happened in the last 39 or 41 years that you got so attached to a photograph that you didn't want to sell? 
I get attached to many things <laughs> and always have. You know, it, it, that's, that's the collector instinct or, or gene that many of us have. Some people don't, but I do. Um, yeah, I mean, I used to collect uh, baseball cards. And um, when I went away to college, my mother cleaned out my, my closet and threw out all the baseball cards. It was the worst day of my life. I was very attached to those baseball cards. Um, yeah, I, I definitely grow attached to the things I love and the things that mean something to me. And I tend to collect them. Another word would be hoard. <laughs> you know, I want it. Uh, I just, uh, yeah, I mean, it's been, I, I, I kind of, I define uh, my collecting as those pictures I take home. <laughs> You know, it's not easy sometimes to, to buy a picture for myself from the gallery and take it home. It's, uh, there's a lot of reasons why it's not a simple thing to do. But once I do it, 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 it crosses a line, it crosses a boundary, and it becomes mine and, and part of my life. And I almost never, ever have sold any of those photographs once they get that far because it's not, it has nothing to do with business anymore, or the gallery, or anything like that. They're, they're part of my life then. You know. According to this photo that's on the, on the invitation, mm -hmm. tell us about it, are you, you must be very attached to it. I am, yeah. very attached to it, yeah. yeah. What, what does this photo have to, to be so precious to you? Um, okay, so I, I uh, in the early 1980s, I, I discovered, I learned about an organization that was called the Photo League, uh, which was, uh, existed from 1936 to 1951 uh, in New York. And um, there were great, great photographers that were part of the Photo League. A few of them were known, but most of them unknown. And I was able to uh, put together a wonderful exhibition and a small catalog and learn a lot about the Photo League. Um, one of the photographers in the league was Consuelo Canaga, who made this picture. But um, in my uh, work in, in assembling a show to travel for an organization called the Gallery Association of New York, um, I was able to borrow a small, actually tiny print of this photograph. Uh, there's a catalog to that show on display here, and, and this photograph's on the cover, and it's life size. That was the size of the picture in the show. And um, I loved this picture. I just loved it. And, and um, I tried to buy it from the owner, and he wouldn't sell it to me. He simply wouldn't sell it to me. I, I tried everything in my power. And this was a long time ago. And I, you know, I had it in my head, if I ever find a print of this photograph, it's for me. And it was uh, at least 15 years later that I received a phone call from a gallery on Martha's Vineyard. If anybody ever heard of Martha's Vineyard, it's a wonderful island uh, off the uh, coast of Massachusetts. And um, uh, an older woman had come in the gallery. She knew Consuelo Canaga. She had two photographs. She asked him uh, if he knew if he had any value. She wanted to sell them. He called me. He described them to me. And he sent them to me. And I bought it for quite a lot of money, much more than I probably would have asked in the gallery. But I wasn't taking any chances. <laughs> I wanted to make sure. This one didn't get away, and, and that's the print in the show. I've had it ever since, yeah. And you're never going to sell it? No. no. <laughs> not, not unless it goes with the whole collection somewhere, and I can visit it with regularity. Then maybe. <laughs> yeah, okay. But there, there is a precious line between being a collector and uh, a gallery owner. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And is it, well, you are combining it, but is it possible? It must be hard. Difficult. Yeah, it's very hard. It's very hard. Um, I don't think all uh, gallery owners, whether it's photography or anything else, uh, care so much about collecting. I think a lot of gallery owners will buy art and keep it and put it in their homes and stuff. But you know, in my conversations with so many like that, uh, it's for sale. <laughs> it's always for sale. You know, and I don't really think they're too many. See, I didn't start out as a dealer. I started out as a photographer, and, and, and I fell in love with photography. So um, when I collect the, these photographs, um, I, I'm able to really switch my mind. It's, it's not a, a, a business decision to, to do it. It's, it's a business decision to determine if I could afford to do it, if I have enough money in the bank account that day to pay for the picture. 
but, um, uh, but it's not a, a, an activity as a dealer at all. Um, but what do your clients think? Yeah, they well... Think you're keeping the best ones for yourself. <laughs> you're using my words against me. Um, that's, that's a really good question, and that's been the only um, uh, difficult part of this whole activity all these years for me, is that I felt, especially in, in the older days, um, you know, how can I collect? How can I buy this picture for myself? I have to keep it in the gallery and make it available to my clients. And um, uh, it's something I struggled with for a long time, and it's frankly, even today, uh, I often make the decision, you know, not to buy a picture for myself that I want to have. I mean, I don't have everything that I could have, for sure, um, in, in some sense of fairness. But I must say, um, it, it's worked over the years. It, it's been okay because uh, uh, photography, one of the blessings and curses of photography, we always say, is that there are too many. <laughs> there are a lot of photographs in the world. And uh, fortunately, there are a lot of great photographs in the world and apparently enough to go around. Uh, so, um, I, I don't, at this point, everybody knows about the collection who, who I work with, and I, I haven't heard one bad word from a client saying, you know, you should have sold me that picture, or you shouldn't really, you know, have a collection, or you always keep the best one. I never heard that from anybody. So I think there have been enough great photographs that have come through me that have satisfied, uh, you know, the collecting desires of, of everybody I work with. So. I, I, don't, I don't really have a moral dilemma about it. Okay. Do, you have, uh, do you regret a photo that you couldn't buy or didn't buy? I, I regret many, <laughs> of course. But you know, every time I start regretting the ones that got away from me, I, I, I kind of <laughs> hit myself on the head and say, but look at all the ones that didn't get away from you. And I have to take the high road <laughs> when I have those around, thoughts. Do you regret buying a photograph? No, no, not at all, because if I regret buying a photograph, I just bring it into the gallery and sell it. <laughs> but, but the truth, I, 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 as I said, I don't think I've ever taken a photograph home that I regretted taking home. I, I really mean that. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's not a simple matter you know, to do that. So, so what, what is it exactly that you are looking for in a photograph? Well, there are many different things. I, I'm, I've always... Um, emphasize the fact that my collection is, is very personal. Uh, it's about me, it's about my life, uh, it's about my experiences. And I actually preach this to all my clients, you know, people who get into collecting seriously. And, you know, I try to steer them into uh, owning photographs, uh, art, if you will, that means something to them for their own personal reasons. Uh, and in photography, it's, it's easier because, uh, you know, uh, especially if you collect vintage photography, not contemporary, it's about the world as it was in different places. So we all have experiences at different points in time, and there are always photographs that remind us of those experiences. So, so it's not so hard to collect in a personal way. Uh, it's no different for me. Uh, I have photographs in, in my collection. Um, I was talking about this the other day. I grew up uh, with a lot of music around me. I love music. Maybe that's why I landed in Woodstock. <laughs> but um, I have many photographs that have something going on that has to do with music or dancing. I used to dance a lot. You know, this sort of thing. And, and I like to, to talk about when my kids were young, I, used to, I found myself buying a lot of photographs with children in them, really. Um, my kids were young, I was having this experience of raising young children, and I wanted to put a lot of pictures of kids up around the house, so I bought those kinds of photographs then. That's fine. Um, it's a little different with me, having been a photographer, I fell in love with the darkroom and, and making prints and all that, so many of the photographs came to close because I fell in love with the print of that photograph. Um, there are examples upstairs where um, uh, I had access to other prints of the same image over many years and I never thought to, to acquire it for myself. I never thought to collect it for myself. But then one day a certain print <laughs> came before me, a uh, very special print for one reason or another, and, and that was the reason that I chose that photograph. So if, if you can conclude that it's not the head that's buying, but the heart? 
makes a decision. Yeah, decision. yeah. I, I, I'd have to say it's about 100% heart, the decision. 100%? Yeah. I say 100% because I've done some stupid things in, in, in my attempts to buy pictures that I really wanted. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, including um, uh, spending money that I didn't have. That's how I know I'm a real collector. <laughs> you know, when you spend money on something to collect that you don't have the money. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think, I hope I haven't done too many stupid things. But um, I definitely collect from the heart, not from the head, yes. But if you see your collection, you have so many famous photographers like Marie Cartier Bresson, André mm -hmm. Cartes, Stein, yeah. Stieg Lietz, um, Dorothy Lang. That's true. That more sounds like the head. No, 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 it's because I've been so fortunate and, and perhaps uniquely fortunate in that I've had access to all these things. Of, been in my gallery. I mean, it's been a great, incredible uh, life of, of being a photography dealer for so many years. I mean, I've really, you know, had access uh, to all these treasures. I mean, not just 150 that are upstairs, but thousands of great photographs by great photographers. How many photos do you have? At home? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, Sam Sturzy, who originated the show, told me that, that I had close to 500. I thought I had 300. Okay, I never count. Them. I never count. <laughs> he counted, yeah. Okay. Um, well, did you ever have the, if, if, if I hear you talk about photography, there sounds a lot of love for photography afterwards. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have the, or did you ever hear of the Stendhal syndrome? Sten Stendhal? Stendhal? I've Stendhal. heard of Stendhal, but I never, I never Stendhal heard about syndrome. his syndrome, no. It's, it's, I think it's, it's lovely. It's, it's falling in love with a piece of art mm -hmm. at the first moment you see it in real life. So did you ever have that? Falling in love, fainting, actually. Fainting? Fainting. <laughs> I, Almost no. fainting. I, I, I've never fainted <laughs> from that. But I have had the experience where I started shaking. Mm -hmm. Which one? Yeah, I really have. Oh, God. Um, I, I, I had that experience with uh, the, G, there's a photograph by Eugene Smith upstairs. It's called Welsh Miners. Do we have it? Stamped? Yeah. And what's interesting is it's a photograph that I, I, I really uh, uh, was emotional about. I was very inspired by it. And it yeah. Uh, as a young photographer visiting Museum of Modern Art and looking at the permanent collection, which I did regularly while I was living in Woodstock. I'd come to New York and I'd go around in a few hours and see every photograph on every gallery. It only took a few hours then. And I would wind up in, in Museum of Modern Art and I, of course the, the entire installation of the permanent collection was inspiring, but this one picture in particular got me. And, uh, I, I handled several prints of this photograph over the years, um, and none of them were interesting to me to own. Personally, they were later prints from copy negative. That's what Smith would do. They were very you know, dramatic prints, as was his way. But when I started working with Life Magazine Archive about uh, 12 years ago, um, and I had access to the files, and there were many original first prints in those files. There were quite a few, actually, in the show. When I came to this one, I, 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 was, I couldn't believe it, because it's, a, um, it's definitely the first print ever made from the negative, and it's not a fine print. It's not worked on in the darkroom and made dramatic like Smith would do. It's a straight print from the negative, but it had that, that same magic, that same emotionality, uh, that, that strange, you know, soot on their face. And, and, and this picture taught me so much about what photography could be. So, and I saw this print, it was like, I, I had no idea such a thing existed. And I remember having, you know, sweating and shaking. Yeah, yeah, it happened. <laughs> in, in what the, the collection you have is mainly black and white. Uh, that's white? true. That's true. It is... Um, uh, I have a couple of color prints. They're sort of extraneous, you know. I, I have them. I have nothing against color. I mean, we show plenty of color, and you all know Saul Leiter, and I was delighted to work with his color photographs all these years. But, um, uh, but again, you know, it's really about the old stuff. It's about the old materials and the old processes, and and. Uh, 
you know, of necessity, that's pretty much black and white. Yeah. yeah. Now, many of the photographs you have, uh, they have this, uh, uh, well, uh, it's, it's about humanity, it's, it's uh, historical, it's social. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the Dorothy Lang photo of uh, mm -hmm. the migrant mother, maybe we can see it. Um, and the Robert uh, Kappa photos, the, mm -hmm. the war photos. Um, that's what we see in your collection, but also apples and pears. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. So how can you... Well, because it's not, again, the, the, it's not an intellectual collection. I, I, I didn't set out with a theme or in any point of view at all. Um, I, I didn't set out, period. It's just as these photographs would come into my life and, and I would see a particular print of a particular image um, that grabbed me, so to speak, and then it would enter the collection. Uh, the pear and apples is, is uh, it's probably one of the most extraordinary prints ever made in photography. I and mean, that's what I really believe about that photograph upstairs. It's, uh, Steichen was a true magician in the darkroom. There was nobody who created prints like Steichen, especially in his early years. And, um, and, and that's such a prime example. It was his favorite photograph. And um, he went to great, great lengths just to create the negative of it. And then he printed it in various ways. And this particular print is, is a, a certain kind of toning on a Palladian paper. Uh, I don't think anybody else would have even come close to knowing how to do it but Steichen. But if you, if you look at the print, it, take it out of the frame <laughs> and look at it in good light, there's nothing, I mean, it's magical. There's nothing else like it. So. Um, it's not humanity, it's a study in, in creating a, a photograph that looks different than all the photographs. I mean, it has this three-dimensional sculptural quality that's sublime, and um, that's enough for me. That's okay. <laughs> you already mentioned uh, some stewards of the Musée des in Lausanne. Mm -hmm. uh, the collection was also there in Lausanne before it was here in Amsterdam. He said last Wednesday, uh, what you collect says something about yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you agree? Who are you? Of course, uh, I am all those photographs, but not here. This is not me. Um, <laughs> well, of course, it, again, it, it comes back down to, to this uh, idea of personal experience. You know, I, I collect what's meaningful to me in my life. And uh, every photograph, one way or another, in my collection, you know, expresses that. Yeah, so. We are looking at the, the migrant mother, the photo of uh, Dorothy Lang. Mm -hmm. I was really... Uh, I had almost a Stendhal syndrome when I saw this one yeah, uh, in, yeah, in real life yeah. because, of course, I knew it, I've seen it in books and everywhere. Mm -hmm. But now I saw it for the first time in print, and it's so well, it's overwhelming. It's, mm -hmm. it's like she's really there or here. Yeah, or yeah. You get to know her. It's yeah. It's it's a particularly beautiful print. It, it's not a vintage print. It wasn't made in 1936. It was probably made in the early 1950s. Um, for some reason, she made this particular print on, on a very beautiful warm paper. I've, again, I've had in my gallery, I'm going to say maybe 10 different prints of this photograph. She made many prints over all the years, and, and uh, this particular print, you know, just has uh, that, that, that great color that makes it look so wonderful. It also has a, a very long inscription on the back. Uh, by her, signed by her to the photographer who she gave it to or sold it to, a photographer that I never heard of actually in San Francisco. Um, so it's, it's a very beautiful special print. It's not the first print of that image that I had at home. The first print of that image I had at home had a, a, a really crazy long story which I won't go into, but um, I, well, it's, it's, it, never mind, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I had that photograph up when my kids were very young, and um, I had a little bit of, this is crazy, right? I, I had this um, feeling that maybe I should take it off the wall because my children look at it, maybe it'll be depressing, it'll be too sad for them, something like that. And so I just had that idea in the back of my mind, and then one day um, I had a visit from the curator of the National Gallery of Canada. Uh, who said she was looking for a good print of the migrant mother for their collection. And she was a, a great client and, and a good friend. And I thought to myself about <laughs> that picture at home. It was, it was really torn, but um, 
It was also at a moment it had gone up a lot in value and we were doing some changes in the gallery and I had this thought, maybe it's not good for me to have this picture. Uh -huh. So I sold that print and, and of course, I mean, maybe six seconds later, I regretted it terribly. <laughs> I thought, what was I thinking? You know? So I had to find another print and it took a few years. And, and I, when these things happen to me, I'm, I'm prepared never to have another print. I, I may never f see the right print again. I may never be able to acquire the right print again. But in this case, a, a good colleague of mine, friend, got this print from the estate of this photographer. I asked her to send it to me. It was the right print, and I bought it, and I had one again. Yeah. Okay. Let's look at some more photos, because I like the stories you tell. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm and not boring you guys, am I? Everyone's, <laughs> nobody's sleeping? Okay, good. <laughs> oh, this one. <laughs> This is a famous one. It's a postcard in the Netherlands. This is, a, this is a silly photograph, isn't it? Yeah. You know, this is, a, this is how, I, I guess, it's a little bit of my insanity and a little bit of my good fortune to have this picture. Good fortune because um, I have a photography gallery, and one day this uh, antique dealer of sorts walked in with this photograph. If I didn't have the gallery, I wouldn't have seen the photograph. But he wanted to sell it. Uh, the foolishness, the insanity, was that he wanted crazy amount of money for it. It's only in a press print. It's, it's a cheaply made, 8x10 glossy, typical press print that was pulled out of a file somewhere. Um, but, but, this is one of those photographs, excuse me, that uh, it's just so incredibly wonderful. And, you know, i had been looking at this photograph since I was a little kid because uh, if you go into any of the pizza parlors in, in Brooklyn, there's always a poster of this picture, <laughs> a cheap poster, you know, like, like you know, a copy of a copy of a copy. copy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this picture, everybody knows this photograph, but I'd never seen a, a, an original print from the original negative, and, and, and this was. So I, I bit the bullet and I, I bought the thing, and I thought to myself, I can never resell it because I, I paid way more than I would ever have the nerve to ask anybody for it. You know, so it's in my collection. <laughs> and do you know the story yeah. behind the photo? Uh, which story? <laughs> yeah, there, but there must be a story. Why, why are you sitting Only there? That, that there was a huge article in um, the International Herald Tribune just a couple of years ago about this photograph and about how nobody knows who made it. And, and uh, the assistant curator, Museum Manat, who I know quite well, was guessing that it was by Louis Hine. And I was saying, what are you talking about? You know, there's a stamp on the back of the photograph. We, we know uh, the agency that, that put out the photograph, and we know the photographer who worked for them. His name was Charles Ebbets. And, um, and the things that, so it's not such a mystery, but apparently it is. I might be the only one who knows it, and now the rest of you know. Okay, yeah. but is it staged, or, or is it spontaneous? Or? That story? Um, uh, no, I, I actually- really have lunch? I, I, have no, I have no idea. I'd like to believe it's real, and it wasn't staged. Because even if you staged it, these guys would have to be really nuts to, to get out there, you know. <laughs> so you have to believe that this is what they did, you know, when they stopped working on, on the skyscraper. They, you know, um, the, the uh, people who worked on these skyscrapers were most often Mohawk Indians. Anybody ever hear that? It's true. Uh, Indian, uh, an Indian tribe, a uh, Native American tribe, excuse me, from upstate New York, and apparently they, they do not experience vertigo. They don't get dizzy yeah. from heights, and they were hired to, to build skyscrapers in New York City. Okay. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. Do, you, do you think it's important to know uh, the story behind uh, each photograph that you buy? <sighs> or do you like to know the story? You know, I, honestly, I, you would think I'd be really interested in, in learning everything about each photograph, okay. but uh, sometimes I know the story, sometimes I will read about or I'll research a little bit, but often, uh, I'm just interested in, in my reason for wanting the picture, not so much the, the thing itself. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, that may sound selfish, but I'm telling you, it's, it's just how these photographs make me feel, not, not the intellectual side of it that really gets me going. Yeah. For instance, this photo, this is Louis Hine. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. It's, it's, it is this too. is an icon. Yeah. <laughs> this is one of those photographs that I, I think, uh, you know, is in, in the consciousness of humankind. It's, it's 
not just that it's been reproduced a lot, but it, it's just such a, um, a, a, a fascinating, powerful um, um, image that's symbolic of the machine age and, and all that. Uh, yeah, so I, this is another one, you know, uh, many photographs, many prints of, of this picture um, had been in my life, different prints. Uh, this one I, I did acquire early on, it was a gift. It was really wonderful. Um, my early work with the Photo League that I talked about before. Um, I worked with a man named Arnold Edel. Arnold Edel was a Hungarian emigre uh, who, you know, was a humanist photographer. He was actually a very good f uh, friend of um, Cornell and Robert Kappa. And uh, he was a f documentary filmmaker as well. And, and when I met him, he was old. And uh, I was up at a studio one day and um, uh, I don't know, we were looking at things he had, looking at his pictures, and, and he pulls this print uh, out of a file. He said, do you like this? <laughs> I said, are you kidding? It's Powerhouse Mechanic. It's one of the great photographs. He said, Hein gave this to me, and his writing's on the back and everything. He said, I'd like to give it to you. Wow. <laughs> you think I was going to sell it after that? No way. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, um, yeah, that, that's very, sp and I have to tell you, I've seen, great prints of this picture, larger prints, beautiful papers, but I've never seen one that looks quite like this one. This one has a glow, isn't it? It really has, again, a sculptural quality and a real inner luminosity to it. It's a beautiful little print, yeah. A little print. What, um, what I saw were also very, very small prints, like, like a, True. a stamp. Yeah, yeah. Is it do you have, uh, <laughs> do you like Well, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes photographers made tiny prints. I mean, they could be contact prints from the negative. Um, but sometimes, like, there's a photograph in the show by Walker Evans of the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, that's the way he printed it. <laughs> that was his preferred way to print that picture when he made it. Um, that print has a nice provenance. It comes from the collection of Beaumont Newhall, one of the most famous photo historians. Uh, but many other small prints that I have are atypical. And so, in some cases, they're the only ones I've seen like that. There's the uh, beautiful little print of a picture called The Pioneer by Rochenko. Not so different than the, um, you know, this little girl, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's just sort of a uh, uh, heroic head. And um, that's a little vintage print. It was, it was pasted, actually pasted on, on an envelope that I think held his negative. So it was like a file reference print, but it's a great little print. And it got separated at some point. I was able to buy it. And, and I've had this sort of side component to the collection of, of small prints of famous pictures. <laughs> I think they're so cool. The little Ouija of, of the critic, very famous photograph. I've never seen another print that small. <laughs> You know, so, so that was, and I have, I must have about 10 or 12 such prints in the collection. You don't see things like that often, no. you know. No. Uh, and the small, uh, the two sisters, Diane the, Arbus? Well, that's a little different in that she, actually, that's a postcard. That little print of the twins by Diane Arbus, uh, she made a number, probably a large number, if I had to guess, at least 40 or 50 prints that size on postcard stock and then sent out the postcard to friends of hers to invite them to an exhibition she was having. <laughs> she was trying to drum up, yeah, she made the prints. Uh, um, I don't know the date, I, I think it was um, 68 or 69, somewhere in there. And um, uh, I had seen others on the market. I was always intrigued, I love that picture, and I was always intrigued with the idea of having one, but usually they come up in auction and I couldn't buy it for myself. But I have a friend who knew Diane Arbus and, and knew, uh, uh, her husband, and after she died, her husband gave him this print, and it had never been sent out. So it's perfect, it's pristine. They're, they're usually banged up because they were sent through the mails and stuff, but this one was just brand, brand new condition, so I bought it from them and kept it. Yeah. Uh, the collection you have has all these well, famous uh, names, uh, like well, Diane Arbus, mm -hmm. uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson, uh, mm -hmm. Robert Kappa, mm -hmm. and well, you can see all of them uh, yeah. there. Um, is, it, is it by chance, or were you really looking out for them? 
was I looking for them? For their, for their photographs, or these photo, photo, photographers? Most often, no. <laughs> most, most often, I was not looking for them. There were very few prints in the collection that I had in mind that I wanted to find the right print to acquire. There were some, but many of them, no. It was just, like I say, it just happened. It was just a moment. It was a particular print that came into my, you know, my realm in a given moment, at a given time, when I thought, you know, this is something that I, that I can have, that I can keep for myself. And often, uh, I didn't make that decision right away. A lot of the pictures were in the gallery for periods of time, and I couldn't sell them, <laughs> you know, which is another um, way I justify this. You know, I did give clients access to a lot of these pictures, and even though I loved them and, and would love to have hung on to them, but then after a while, nobody wants to buy it. And, you know, if I still have that same feeling, well, I'll just buy it myself. Um, but no, um, uh, Cardi Bresson, I'll, I'll tell you another story. There's a great small print of the, um, uh, the fat man <laughs> and the kids in the bottom and the sort of holes in the wall, the windows uh, of a building. It's, it's a picture I think everybody who loves photography loves that photograph. It's a really amazing, um, it's an amazing image, it's an amazing composition. and. Um, one of Cartier Bresson's best, I think. Um, <clears throat> when I was working with Joanna Steichen, Edward Steichen's widow, she had a box uh, in, in her storage marked other photographers. And there were photographs in there by photographers other than Steichen that Steichen had in his collection, if you will. And uh, this one and two other little Cartier Bresson prints were, were in there. And, uh, and they were all great. Um, Two of them were on a really nice paper. This is one of those two. One was a little glossy. And anyway, so I bought them from Joanna. There they were. And it was the same thing. Well, I really like to keep this. I really like to keep this. Let me put it aside, you know, and, and then eventually, you know, I, I, I decided to hang on to that print. After I did that, and I had it really for a few years, I loaned it to a show of vintage Cartier Bresson prints in my gallery. This isn't long ago. This is maybe four or five years ago. And Martine Frank, who was married to Cartier Bresson, uh, was in, I also represented her, and uh, she was in, in the gallery and she saw the print and she said, let me see that, you know. Hmm. She said, this was in the scrapbook, right? And um, I, Cartier Bresson very, now very famously had made a scrapbook of uh, prints of all the images he liked for years and years. Beautiful thing. It was exhibited in Paris not many years ago. A great book about it. And it's considered very important that these things came out. So what happened apparently was that uh, these were in the scrapbook when he brought them to Steichen to show him his photographs when they were working on the exhibition. And this and the other had, the paste came off and they fell out of the scrapbook. And he told Connie Brisson to keep, I mean, he told uh, Steichen to keep them, to hang on to them. And, uh, but the real surprise was when Martin told me this is the first print he ever made of that picture. It was from 1933, I believe, but he never made a print till he did the scrapbooks, and that was just after the war. So I would never thought it was the first print, but it turns out that that print upstairs is the first print he ever made of that picture. Yeah. You know, when, when you, uh, something else, when you uh, look at the list of all these uh, photographers like Steigen and Stieglitz and André Gertes and all these famous photographers, um, they are all Jewish. Huh. Is that, is that, well, is th wow, may yes, maybe that's why the show is here, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but they are all famous, they're all very good. How do you explain? I, Sasha, I, I haven't. I, I won't say I have no idea, but it's a question that's been asked a lot over many years. Um, it's been posed to me by different people. It's, I have no easy answer to that. I don't even have a difficult answer to that. I mean, I think you really have to uh, look into the, um, the history of, of, of Jews, the sociology of Jews, um, the uh, moments in history and, and where they were and how they got there and immigration patterns and uh, ways of making a living, you know, correct and incorrect. I mean, I think they all fold into this. I mean, there's also uh, a, um, a tradition of, I think, of humanism, you know, a tradition of being the outsider and the other, and in photography, you, you behave that way as a photographer. There's so many 
interesting ideas as to why so many of the photographers were Jewish. And um, we were talking about it. I think that's a really good topic for somebody to, to do some, you know, a couple of years of research on and write a good book and, and put together a good exhibition demonstrating it. Yeah. They weren't uh, allowed in the, in the traditional jobs. So they were. Sometimes, uh, that's true. That's true. Yeah. 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 Free yeah. jobs. And for instance, like Andre Katesh, when he went to New York, mm -hmm. he didn't speak the language. And photography right. was an international language. Right. That's Maybe. true. I That's well, well, it might be. I mean, of course, he was a photographer in Paris before he went mm -hmm. to New York. But um, I, I think more about these guys in the photo league. I mean, they were, I think, about 96% of them were, were Jewish. But they, they all came from uh, generally, sometimes first, more often second generation immigrants. Um, most of them didn't have much money. They lived in the Lower East Side. They were trying to get a toehold in this country and establish themselves one way or another. And um, uh, they were all politically active. They were all left wing, sometimes hard carrying communists, which meant something different in the 30s, of course. And, um, you know, they had this, this social mission that was part of their lives and also that they were interested in. And the Photo League, you know, look where they went to photograph. They photographed in Harlem, they photographed in Coney Island, uh, they photographed in Times Square, you know, these places where. where uh, uh, people masked, common people, uh, black people, um, Spanish people. I mean, they just had the need to reflect on society that they could relate to, I think. Um, but that was just that moment in time in that group. It doesn't explain why so many other photographers were Jewish. I mean, Alfred Stieglitz was, was Jewish. Steichen wasn't. Uh, Stieglitz uh, was a extremely, not extremely, but from a very comfortable, well-off family. Uh, he was very patrician in his attitudes. He didn't treat himself like, like an immigrant or a Jew. <laughs> you know, he treated himself as a, as a person of, of privilege who was brilliant and, and um, knew more about art than anybody else. Uh, he happened to be Jewish. You know, I, I can't tell you why. I don't know. We had, uh, we, I'm talking about we, but we, you, <laughs> had uh, the um, Soul Lighter uh, ex exhibition uh, last year, two, two years, years ago. ago. Yeah, two years ago here. Yeah. Uh, you had a very special connection with Soul mm -hmm. Lighter. Could yeah. you tell us about that? Well, um, I represented Saul. I guess I was the only gallery who ever represented him. Um, I met Saul 1994, 20 years ago. and. Um, uh, I met him because I was friendly with a, a woman named Jane Livingston who had created uh, several exhibitions called the New York School. And then finally her, her book was being published and um, she suggested I meet Saul Leiter. So we did an exhibition in 1994 of black and white photography. Uh, and uh, it, it coincided with the book launch. So that's what happened. And I was often running with Saul Leiter and, and we had a really a very <laughs> very, very uh, meaningful 20-year relationship, uh, not just to me, but for everybody in my gallery. You all met Saul. I mean, you know, what kind of a wonderful and interesting human being he was. Well, our gallery became his family uh, because his original family, um, which was a deeply religious Jewish family, his father was a, 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 not just a rabbi, but he was quite famous and published and well-known. Um, uh, Anyway, Saul was born into that family and left it. Uh, didn't make his parents too happy, but it was something that haunted him his entire life. Uh, that he went his own way against the very, very strong will of, of his father. So, uh. Do you think it's important to have a good relationship with, uh, if possible, if they are still alive, with the photographer you represent? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I have always... Um, approached my relationships uh, with the photographers I represent uh, as a partnership, really as a partnership. My feeling is that we have to like each other, we have to work together, we have to strategize together, we have to share a lot of uh, everything, including money, and um, uh, it's, it's got to work, you know. If I've tended to work with photographers not just for a couple of years and they move on. I, I have many, many really long-term relationships, and I think that's 
because that's the way I like to work. It's, um, I tend to be a loyal human being, and I kind of you know, hope that the people I work for, the photographers I work for, are, are loyal also, that they have good reason to be loyal. So that's the way it is in my gallery, yeah. When, when I saw the, uh, the exhibition here, I don't know about the 500 photos you have at home, but um, in this exhibition, the most recent photograph is from 1992. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. No, it's true. Which, which one? Yeah. Which Sally one Mann. is it? Sally Mann is the, the most recent photograph. Nineteen. Oh, the Sally Mann. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 And before that, most recent was 1971. Diane Arbus. What happened with photography after 1992, or with you? Well, the Sally Mann is really accidentally in my collection. I mean, I. I <laughs> Do you regret it? <laughs> no, 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 but it's not typical. It's really not typical in that it is such a light photograph. I mean, I, I know Sally. Uh, she's been a friend for years, and um, I had plenty of access to all her pictures, and, and I never collected one. But um, I did, there was one picture I saw in an exhibition years ago, and it's not a very well-known one, and it reminded me so much of my daughter at that age. It's a beautiful photograph. It's not a nude or anything like that. She's out in a field and there's a bond at the edge and she's wearing this little dress and my daughter had it very soon. It just reminded me of her so much. So I bought that Sally Man and, um, and gave it to my daughter actually. It's hanging in the house, but I, it's hers. The same daughter that was here. Yeah. yeah. And um, so that's why I had a Sally Man. This one was by accident. I had a, a client and he was selling off his collection and I bought it, a, a bunch of pictures and, and he had it in, it's not in the same frame here, but he had it in a really nice frame. And I, I bought the photographs from him and we were, uh, I think we were bringing some pictures up to Woodstock to put in our house in Woodstock. And I thought this would be nice in the twins room, Gabrielle's younger daughters. It's just, I know they'd like the picture and whatever and it was in this really nice frame already. so. <laughs> I, I kept it, but that's not typical of, of um, uh, what I would collect. Actually, yeah. What happened with photography after 1992? I I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I want to. <laughs> I don't want to say it went downhill. <laughs> it didn't go downhill, but it did change. <laughs> it changed a lot. What happened? Nothing happened. I think, um, I'll tell you what happened. The digital age happened. You know, it's, um, we all know digital technology has revolutionized our lives and certainly is revolutionizing photography. And, um, and how photographers make photographs and how they think about photographs and, and the, the uh, possibility of what they can do with photographs or visual images, let's say. And um, that's the change. That's the difference. Do you yeah. have a digital photograph in your collection? No. Why not? They're too new. I'm telling you, I'm a dinosaur. I only <laughs> like those old ones. So what, I mean, that, that's... You, what is it that but, but you, but by now the you, difference between an analog print and a digital print? First, let me say that by now you know that all these pictures are connected to my past. They're not connected to my present or my future. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the difference is, is, again, I as a photographer, really fell in love with printmaking in the darkroom. I love the process. Uh, I find it magical, as pretty much everybody who ever made a print finds it. Um, there's nothing wrong with Photoshop. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with, with creating a, a visual image digitally. It's just simply different. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a different process. It looks and feels and smells different. And uh, for me, it, it, it doesn't have much emotional content. <laughs> but you, you know? don't have photos from uh, more recent periods, uh, mm -hmm. even though there are photographers who work uh, with film. No, that's, that's true. That's true. So it just, photography itself, not just yeah, the, the yeah, way it is yeah, printed yeah, or uh, yeah, photographed. Yeah. Photography itself has also changed, in your opinion? Um, absolutely. But there's another reason. I, I, it's, I'm not... Um, how should I say, uh, I'm not tempted um, to own a photograph often when it's available, when it's very available. I'll give you an example. Um, when I was younger, I always wanted to have a Robert Frank photograph, or two. And in the old days, you go to an auction and there'd be 10, 15 Robert Franks, and they always sold between $800 and $1,200, always. 
And, and they always sold for one bid more than I was prepared to pay. But I figured, okay, there'll be more in the next auction. So, you know, when something's really available, it's not, not so you, compelling. You it's only when you can't it. have it <laughs> that suddenly the desire <laughs> builds, you know. <laughs> right? We all know Sounds about like that, it. right? <laughs> when you can't have something, that's when you really want it. <laughs> okay, are there, in, in the meantime, uh, questions from the audience? Thank you. You did already a good uh, uh, job. By Thank you. Knowing more about you as a collection. But I visited several collections here in Amsterdam, and uh, sometimes you see their pictures all hanging on the wall in their house, all over the toilets, whatever, in the bathroom. Sometimes you see them still packed because it's the thing they want to own it. What kind of collection are you? Are you exposing them on your walls, or are you just putting them in the. No, no, no. I, I definitely expose them. <laughs> I do, in, in my house, and, and I take them out of the house a lot and loan them to exhibitions and bring them to the gallery and other places to show them to people. I live, I really live, you know, quite actively with all the photographs. Uh, I see them, I view them all with regularity. Um, I'm not a big believer. I actually, it's probably one reason that I don't have more. It gets unwieldy to have. Too many, and we have so many in the gallery anyway that sit in boxes, and I feel so terrible <laughs> that you know I haven't opened up a particular box in two years or something. So no, I, 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 my pictures are out. And representing your life as well. Yeah. So yeah. I also I like to look at them. <laughs> you know, I really I really like to look at them. Um, I'm a very big fan of André Capes, and uh, I just saw one picture. And I was wondering if there was a reason for that. Did you, couldn't you get a hold of more, or do you have more at home? <laughs> um, I don't think I have more at home. <laughs> I certainly don't have any other like that one. You, you know, the cute answer to your question is after you have that one, you know, that's it. <laughs> that's, that's as perfect as it gets. And anything else would, would be less. The truth is there are many. Andre Curtej pictures that I love, that I would be delighted to, to own. But, um, you know, they, the, the good vintage prints, the carte postales like that one, are very expensive. They've always been very expensive. Truthfully, I couldn't afford it. The only reason I, I bought this one, there was a period of time when I represented the estate, uh, lasted about seven or eight years, and, and um, this print was owned by a friend who was a great, very early collector in the 1970s. And uh, he wanted to sell it, and he, he really wanted a lot of money. I paid more for that than anything I owned by far. Uh, but he gave me two years to pay it out, and I thought I justified it by the fact that I did um, represent the estate, so I should have the greatest, the single greatest print of arguably his greatest picture. And, um, but you know, by the time I paid it off, I really did want to keep it for myself. I offered that print for sale. That's one of the few prints in the collection that I've actually offered for sale once or twice while it's been in my collection. But I always asked way more than I could ever possibly get for it, <laughs> expecting that I would keep it. And it's been that way, and I'm not unhappy about it. It would have, I mean, you know, the money would have been nice, and then it would have been gone, and I would have missed the print for the rest of my life, and that would not have been acceptable, so. Uh. Can you pinpoint when photography suddenly became commercially valuable? In my opinion, it's the starting of the Photographer's Gallery in New York in 1973, but can you correct me or do you agree with that? Suddenly, for collectors, it became well, an item to collect pictures and pay big prizes for that. Before that, of course, you had many collectors, but not on this massive scale. And you started yeah. right after that. Yeah. So did you feel the sign of the times? Or? N no. Um, OK. It's um, usually considered that the, the beginnings of the, quote, modern market for photography started with the Witkin Gallery in 1969 <clears throat> and Light Gallery, I think, 1971. Those were the first sort of serious photography galleries in New York that put photographs up on the walls and, and asked 
uh, real money for them. You know, $150 for an Ansel Adams or $75 for Gary Winogrand. That was real money in those days for a photograph. And um, uh, I, I don't know, you know, I, I think it was gradual, it took time, but people realized that A, photography was a wonderful medium and great photographers made, you know, uh, prints of photographs that, that other people and museums really wanted to have, really wanted to acquire. And as I say, it took years, but slowly but surely the prices began to rise. Um, when I got involved uh, commercially, opened my first gallery, it's 1981, I was sort of at the beginning of the second wave of selling photographs for money. And I can tell you, even at that point, it was very difficult. I mean, there weren't many people who would pay maybe the going price then was $400 in an exhibition for, for a living photographer. Um, you didn't sell more than one or two or three if you were lucky. And there were very few museums who would buy it and so on. Um, but um, things changed. You know, the Getty Museum in 1984 began to collect photographs and they uh, appropriated uh, a portion, rather, uh, $30 million for acquiring several great, great private collections. Today they'd be priceless. I don't know what it would cost. But um, that was a big change because that uh, made the Wall Street Journal and that opened the eyes of some people who were wealthy that hmm, maybe these ph photographs that I like so much really do have value. Maybe I should think about buying some. And, and that kind of um, uh, mindset increased over time. Uh, but you know, the, the crazy, what I think, because I've been around a while, crazy high prices for a lot of photography now, it's, it's nothing compared to a contemporary art, uh, modern art. Uh, I don't think the prices for photographs would be nearly as high as they are right now if the prices for um, an Andy Warhol or a Mark Rothko, et cetera, uh, haven't gone to, to the stratosphere. Um, you know, those, the market for, for that kind of art has kind of pulled up the prices of photographs during the last 10 or 15, even 20 years. Um, I don't know what to say about it. I mean, it's just, it's the way it is. It's the way it is. I, I, I think um, one, one thing that's going on, the, um, and I see this firsthand, so many more people around the world are willing to buy a photograph now than before. I mean, thousands of people buy photographs now. But the wonderful thing about photography, there's always good quality photography that, that's not really crazy expensive. I mean, it's one thing to buy a, you know, the first print of a famous Claudia Brisson photograph or Chez Mondrian by Cortez, but there's great photography on the walls of, of this city right now that you can buy for an amount of money that's affordable to most people. And, and there's nothing wrong with it, it's great. So, so that's the wonderful thing about photography. It's not just the expensive stuff and the commercialism. I mean, photography is very democratic in that way. Uh, I was very curious, and you told us that you had your own career as a photographer. Uh, is there a possibility where we can admire your own work? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm not showing. <laughs> someday, someday. Someday, someday I'm going to call Bernadette and say, you want to give me a show? <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> okay, it's a pity. Okay, well. next question is over there. What is going to happen with your collection after 120 years? <laughs> is there any foundation or is there any foundation? What are you going to do? No, no, not yet. I don't know what's going to happen, but I... I oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the, the, the actually, um, the, the very, very honest answer is that my collection is mostly owned by my gallery, and my gallery is now, and this is only for the last three years, is owned by the employees of the gallery. So although it's my collection and I built it and it's still, you know, I consider it my collection, the actual ownership of it is the gallery. So um, when it was only mine, um, I could imagine maybe I would you know, create a foundation or donate it or just leave it for my children to figure out or whatever. But um, that it's owned by the gallery, the gallery will have to decide what will happen to the, to the collection. Okay.
More questions. Last question. Over there. I'll have some influence on the, the decision, I hope. <laughs> what is it about you that all these famous photographers trusted you with their work? Uh, well, first of all, they weren't all alive at the time. <laughs> you know, uh, some of the photographers up there were long gone. I don't know, but I'm not the only person who's been trusted. I mean, you know, there are many good galleries and they work with great photographers who've trusted them. I mean, I have colleagues who, who work with some of the greatest photographers and uh, there's no problem in a long-term relationship. I don't know, you know, in photography, especially those of us who've been doing it for a long time, as I was saying, there wasn't much of a market. There wasn't much money involved in the beginning. We were all, uh, in a sense, struggling to have photography accepted and seen and, and, and felt about as we did, that it was really special. You know? So when you start from that place, it really wasn't a commercial enterprise. The commercial was like, can we live? Can we survive while we're you know, doing all this work with photography? Uh, maybe that's part of the answer. You know, it, it wasn't a big business in the old days when a lot of those relationships were created. You know, so. Okay, the final question goes to Uh, you told us uh, just now uh, that you uh, left your work or your collection to um, the gallery. Why did you leave it to the gallery and not to a foundation? Well, well, I haven't left it anywhere. It's just that the gallery owns it. Yeah, I used to own the whole gallery. Now I own part of the gallery and the employees own part of the gallery. That's the difference. Yeah. Oh, just one more final question. How many final questions do we have? Just back? I saw the exhibition and I saw two famous spots of New York, the Flat Iron Building and the marvelous picture of the Brooklyn Bridge. Mm -hmm. What are your uh, sites to choose this picture? and not other ones. So I got, they are iconic. Mm -hmm. Why are they iconic? And why others not? What's your view? Well, well I, I, I'm not sure why some of these are iconic and others aren't. I mean, for, for me, uh, that word iconic, which we all know is overused these days, I mean, a picture becomes iconic when it sort of enters the, the collective consciousness. Iconic spots. Oh, okay, okay. Well, in the case of the Brooklyn Bridge, I grew up in Brooklyn. I'm from Brooklyn. I'm proud of Brooklyn, uh, even before it became the new Brooklyn. <laughs> and, um, and I have a number of photographs that, that are about Brooklyn, just because that's my life. Uh, Coney Island, I lived actually quite close to Coney Island. I have a lot of photographs of Coney Island in my collection. Um, the Flatiron, uh, which, which one is the Flatiron? I'm, which is, at the yeah. Yeah. Is that the flat iron? I don't, I don't, I don't think it's the flat iron. Okay, okay, but it's in the background. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. That, that's Jesse Tarbox Beale's photograph of, uh, yes. Um, well, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I, I love that photograph. Uh, I'm not, I mean, we don't like the Flatiron building. It's a very unusual, wonderful piece of architecture. But it, I, I, I wasn't interested necessarily in having a, a photograph of the Flatiron building. Um, I was lucky enough to acquire the entire uh, archive that remained of this photographer, Jesse Tarbox Beals, and there were five or six similar pictures made in that place with the Flatiron building in them. But this one particular one, I just love the print. I love the atmosphere of it. I love the, the sense of, of the t moment in time and there's the Flatiron building looming and all that. It just spoke to me and, and I was able to hang on to it. Yeah, that's all. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. Uh, finally, um, Howard. Yes, you, Sasha. Yes. <laughs> Last Wednesday, when we, we were having dinner together with uh, some people from the Jewish Museum, and you told me about uh, well, the secret of the eternal life, or almost <laughs> eternal life. <laughs> all right. All, all right. The reason so, why so many photographers. Okay, I'll follow up. I'll follow up. <laughs> how, how many of you are photographers? 
And how many of you have worked extensively in the dark room with the chemicals and everything? Raise your hand. Okay, so you're the chosen few. And why are you the chosen few? We were talking about the fact that photographers, famous photographers, maybe you're gonna have to get famous, seem to live forever, <laughs> right? That they're 93 when they die, they're 100, they're 87, and this is one after the next. It's really strange, but it's true. There are very few famous photographers who have not lived to at least 80 and often to 90. And what's the reason for that? So I have a theory, which Sasha obviously uh, enjoys and perhaps even believes, and my theory is that Fixa is the elixir. <laughs> 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 right? If you breathe in enough of those fumes of the fixer, it gives you eternal life. Okay. <laughs>